Up until last November, Dennis Bird seemed to be living the American dream. Married to his high school sweetheart, he had a beautiful family and a promising career in the National Football League. But last fall, things changed for Dennis Bird. Today, he no longer has football, but he still has his family. And he has something else, an incredible faith that helped turn tragedy into triumph. It was in high school in Mustang, Oklahoma, that Dennis Bird first took up the sport of football, a sport that would greatly impact the rest of his life. It was also in high school that Dennis met his future wife, Angela. Together, they made a striking couple at the junior-senior prom. The two first met in church, the same church where they were married in 1986. Today, both remain deeply committed to their faith. Let's talk about your faith for a mm -hmm. moment. It obviously means so much to you. How did it evolve? Well, it started from the day that I was born. My parents christened me in church, and um, they kept me in church over the years. In fact, uh, all the way through college, and uh, Angela and I, when we were married, of course, we were married in the same church that we met each other in, and um, then we christened our daughter at the same church. The so church is a very important part of our life, and uh, very fortunate that it is because it would, was those same um, beliefs and that same faith that I had grown up with that I um, rested against and used whenever I'd broken my neck. From high school, Dennis went on to win a scholarship to the University of Tulsa. In 1988, he was named second team All-American and was later drafted by the New York Jets. For the next three years, Dennis Bird's life would center around three things. His faith, his family, daughter Ashton was born in 1990, and football. Even though the Jets were struggling, Dennis had won a position as a defensive starter, a unit he said was just beginning to jail. But this past November, things changed. In one brief moment, the football career that Dennis Bird had worked so hard to achieve was destroyed. But this is the real bad news. Second play of the third quarter, as we showed you earlier, Jets defensive lineman Scott Mercero and Dennis Bird collide. On the replay, you can see Bird's head hits his teammate's shoulder. He was down on the field for about eight minutes. Mercero got up. He was okay, but Bird, he was carted off and taken to Lenox Hills Hospital where he was examined by their spine team. Jet spokesman said Bird was experiencing lower body paralysis. Let's go back to November 29th, mm -hmm. the day that changed your life. Right. Did you have any unusual feelings or any premonitions going into the game? No. The day was, and the preparation was the same as it always is. You're very much into a routine in preparing to play the game. Um, that particular play, I remember quite vividly. Um, I've played it in my mind a thousand times over and over. That was the last play that I'll ever have in, in football, so that's probably the one that I'll keep forever. And, um, Tell me about the play. I, I remember lining up. I remember all the cues that you pick up. Um, after a while, you learn to read certain things. And I remember um, knowing before the snap that it was going to be a pass, you know, the way the offensive linemen were set, the snap count, etc. cetera. And uh, whenever he snapped the ball, I came around the corner, and I'd beaten the offensive tackle. And I was coming up to the quarterback, and he stepped up, uh, which was a, a great move on his part. But I swatted the ball out. I remember looking at the ball and swatting at the ball and knocked it out. And as my momentum brought me around, I noticed there was another player there. I knew it was a team member. I didn't know who it was at the time. It was Scott Mercero. But of course, everything happened so quickly that I couldn't see who it was. And I ran into him. And uh, I remember very well the noise in my head. Uh, it was uh, an explosion. I remember falling to the ground and um, a, a bit dazed, but it was you know, a feeling that you've felt a thousand times before. I tried to get out in the same way as I've done a thousand times before. And um, I, I couldn't, you know, I felt the bones in my neck that were broken, and I, I also heard them. And I knew at that point that I had done something very wrong, um, that I had broken my neck. I didn't know that I was paralyzed, and then I tried to move my limbs, and they wouldn't move. And at that point, I knew that something was seriously wrong. What's it like today to watch the replay? Um, it's not painful to see. It's, uh, you look at it and you realize that it was, it was a, a rather 
um, powerful collision. You can certainly see why um, my neck would would give way under such pressures, but it doesn't really bother me. It's not really painful to watch. What was your darkest hour? With, uh, without question, uh, it was the first week that I was in uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, that I would wake up in the halo brace um, in the early hours of the morning, and I couldn't move. I didn't know where I was. I was horribly frightened, and I couldn't figure out what had happened or once again where I was, and that was the most frightening experience that I've ever had in my life. And, uh, but, you know. Where did yeah. you find comfort? Could you find any? Yeah, well, in Christ and in my wife and in my family and all the people that um, came together to help me. You know, That's where I found comfort and all the happy faces that would come into the room and uh, just visit and talk and the people that prayed with me. That's where I found my comfort. Do you believe in miracles? If you don't, look at this. Here's a man the doctor said would probably never be able to move again. But today, he's walking tall. At first, the doctors warned that you might be a quadriplegic right, for life. Right. Did you know when they told you that, that you would be able to prove them wrong? Did you have that feeling? Yeah, I did. Um, I knew at the time I was paralyzed. They told me that I was a quadriplegic. Um, but immediately, I set my goals um, towards recovery. And uh, I began, I remember the, the feeling of what it is not to feel. Um, it's a very frightening experience whenever you try and move something and it won't move. But I remember time after time after time coaching those muscles, trying to, trying to get those nerves to work again. And um, every waking moment I was trying to move something. And at the end of the week, I finally got my toe to twitch. And uh, at first they thought it was just involuntary, that it was a muscle spasm that I could do it over and over and over, and I finally proved to him that in fact that I was doing that. And then it went from moving the toe um, to where everything that I have back today, being able to walk, being able to feed myself, brush my teeth, everything I had to relearn, all these activities just like I was a child. Dennis says his road to recovery has been the result of his spiritual strength giving him strength physically. And just watching him, you do get the feeling there's something greater than biology or psychology at work here. You have said that God chose you for this injury for a reason. Mm -hmm. Why did he choose you? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy in the fact that God knew that I could accept this. It says in the Bible that he knows what we'll do uh, before we even do it. Uh, he knows how we'll react in these situations. Dennis Bird had to be completely paralyzed to the point where he had to rely in Christ and had to rely on God. Through my weakness, his strength was made perfect. Um, that's in 2 Corinthians. And um, it was through all this that I re truly realized and found out that I, that I had to really rely on Christ and rely on God. There was nothing else I could do. And, uh, I guess he knew you had Angela also. <laughs> yeah, he knew I had Angela, which is... It, there's no way that I could have made it without her being there. You know, she was a, my constant companion through the whole ordeal, and uh, I thank God for her. Oh. This is the outpatient rehab at St. John Medical Center in Tulsa. Dennis spends many hours a week here trying to gain back the things he's lost. How difficult is it for you to realize that you will never be an athlete again, perhaps never be able to run like you once did or never be able to play certain sports? Uh, that's very difficult. The hardest part for me isn't dealing with the fact that I can't play um, sports again. It's knowing that I can't play football again. I can't enjoy those memories and build other memories uh, on the football field. That that is an experience that's totally galvanized through hard work and um, the joys and the triumphs and the tragedies of 
football, just the way it is. It's a wonderful game. It's a roller coaster of a game. You know, you're up, you're down. And uh, I prefer a roller coaster to the merry-go-round anyway. So. <laughs> what are your goals now physically? Well, my goals, I would like to attain the same strength that I had as a football player. I've brought my weight back up, and I've been working very hard on the things like the bench press and military press and squat. My goals are to bring myself back to the point that I was at the injury, and um, very lofty goals. Can you do it? Absolutely. No doubt about it. It just takes time and a lot of hard work, but I can do it. In addition to rehab, much of Dennis's time these days is spent being a celebrity. Last month, he was the keynote speaker at the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Banquet in Tulsa. I spent many, many hours lying in bed at the Mount Sinai Hospital, giving this message and, and telling what I know, what's happened to my life, to the ceiling over my head, to the clocks on the walls, to the pictures on the walls, and dreaming and praising God for the moment that I would be here and to get to address you and to thank my God and to thank the people that prayed for me. This is a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. I can't imagine through such tragedy how man could be so blessed. I consider myself truly a very fortunate man. Even New York, that tough town, has found a soft spot in its heart for Dennis Bird. He was honored this past spring at the Mets opening game. And then there's the media. We can't seem to get enough of this gentle man from Oklahoma. How do you feel now about becoming a national celebrity? Mm -hmm. Diane Sawyer, Regis and Kathy mm -hmm. Lee, Tom Brokaw, all yeah. clamoring for an interview. Um, I don't know. I, I would just prefer to be Dennis Bird. I just prefer to be hunting or fishing somewhere in a quiet place. Um, that's what I would prefer. Um, but these things, um, they, they are prestigious and they are fun. I do enjoy them very much, but I'm also very much a private person. I like to just enjoy my family and the friends that I have. Because of your celebrity status now, mm -hmm. yeah. thousands, millions of right. kids are right. listening to you. What message right. do you hope you could give to them? Well, I'd like to give them the message of uh, what it's like um, to do the right thing in this world, just to live right. You know, there are kids killing kids for tennis shoes and for jackets. Um, that's not the way to live. That's not the way to die. Um, I feel that it's my responsibility to be a role model, um, regardless of what other athletes feel like. These kids that listen to you, we have the wonderful opportunity, the wonderful privilege in the fact that these kids listen to us. Many times they won't listen to their pastor, church, or their parents, but they'll listen to an athlete that is a role model to them. And I'd like to tell them something um, that'll help their life because if we don't teach them something or tell them something, somebody else is going to, they're bound to, and it might not be something that we want our kids to hear. Now you have established a foundation. Mm -hmm. What do you want to achieve with that? Well, our goals are to bring kids in from all over the country and let them enjoy summer camp. Like I remember summer camp, you know, the, the evenings around the campfire listening to stories, um, the physical activities, just being outdoors. We want to get them as far away from the clinical, sterilized atmosphere of a hospital as we can. Um, there was a point in my life six months ago where I wasn't sure that I would be able to enjoy the hunting, the fishing, the outdoors like I used to. And um, there were no guarantees. Um, I want to take the people that are in that situation. I want to give them that opportunity. Without football, does mm -hmm. the future scare you at all? No, it doesn't, it doesn't scare me at all. That's a part of my life that I loved and played with a tremendous passion. Um, I'll find something else, I assure you. I don't know what. What about the future, five, ten years mm -hmm. from now? What do you hope to be doing? Uh, I'll, t I'll be very frank. I would like to be writing for an outdoor magazine. I enjoy writing, and I love the outdoors. That's something, uh, if I could put those two together, I'd be a very happy person. Looking back on everything that's happened to you the past six months, mm -hmm. what have you learned about yourself? I learned about Dennis Bird, why my wife loves me so much, why my daughter loves me. I learned that I didn't have to be uh, a football star. 
I didn't have to have any notoriety. I didn't have to be 6'5", 270, bench press this or squat that. That my wife loved me for the things that was inside of me. Um, she loved me um, because the Dennis Bird that she fell in love with was a, a gentle guy. Um, she says I have a big heart. I don't know. I just come into a valley, one like I've never been before. I keep searching for a way out. It seems like padlocks are on the doors. Well, there must be another sunrise, another sunset that I'll see. God will make this trial a blessing. That's the love he has for me. God will make this trial a blessing. Though it sends me to my knees. And though my tears flow like a river, yet in him there's sweet relief. There's no need to get discouraged. There's no need to talk to be. God will make this trial a blessing, and the whole wide world will see. I learned that I can trust in God and trust in Christ and lay everything in His hands. And I learned that I didn't have to always be the one that takes care of my little daughter, that every now and then she'd take care of me. And uh, that's really what being a daddy and being a husband, being a Christian is all about. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I went through this accident. Um, it, I have matured in a way um, that could very well have taken me an entire lifetime to mature in six months. And um, I only pray now that I'll never forget the lessons that I've learned. Your recovery, mm -hmm. has it been a miracle? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's six months after the accident and uh, I can walk, I can hold my daughter, I can hold hands with my wife. Um, I couldn't do anything six months ago. I was paralyzed from my shoulders down. Um, there's no question about it. Uh, it's a miracle.